Hello, and welcome to yet another episode of, uh, of BLD Tech Talks. I hope you're excited, look at the same cyclist that I am, and ready to go dive deeply into computer vision. So what is it going to be all about? So everyone probably here have used it once, Snapchat, face swap or whatever, and all has to do with cornerstone technology with something with computer vision. My first experience was with a photo camera. I can show you one right here. This is a normal picture camera, and it had something in there like face recognition. Let me show you it right now. If I, if it's possible, yeah, here we go. It just recognizes my face already a long time ago. So today we're going to talk about computer vision and these these kind of things may, may make it happen. Daniel and Rodrigo will tell you all about it and they will eventually introduce them, uh, themselves uh, for what they are doing at their job and, and eventually they will walk you through to one of their experiences with computer vision and even take you along by live coding that you can do yourself as well. So let's get them out here. Daniel and Rodrigo, can you come to the floor? Hi there. Yes. Hello. Hey, hello. Welcome to the BLD Tech Talks. I hope you are both are excited. So yeah, how are definitely. You feeling, Daniel? I'm feeling pretty well. Yeah. Looking forward to it. Perfect. And Rodrigo, how are you doing? I'm doing great. I'm also looking forward uh, to start uh, the presentation and uh, share what we have learned in this couple of years about computer vision with everyone. Great, great, great to hear. I also want to know how it is in, on, on YouTube. So have everyone that's on YouTube, please send, them, send us some nice comments and uh, what do you think and uh, how good looking we are even in these COVID times <laughs> and, um, and help them get through this to explain you about computer vision. Okay, good luck, Rodrigo, I will give you the floor. Okay. Enjoy. Thank you very much and welcome guys to our uh, presentation about computer vision. Uh, we will start talking a little bit about ourselves. Uh, so Daniel, go ahead. Yes, that will be me. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm a backend developer, uh, currently working on uh, computer vision uh, with uh, Python uh, and also doing uh, Java API development. Uh, I'm a software engineer at uh, Capgemini uh, for Blue Harvest. And I've been working at Capgemini since 2017. Uh, if I'm not at work, uh, you can find me in the gym or uh, coding my own game. And that in the picture is me. I'm Rodrigo Hammerly. I'm full stack developer uh, working on computer vision lately in Python, Java, and sometimes TypeScript. I'm not related to computer vision. I'm a software engineer at Blue Harvest, that is a unit for Capgemini and it has been working for Capgemini since 2018 and uh, solving complex problems on uh, my family are my biggest passions in life. So uh, what are we doing currently? Uh, we are working in improving document processes uh, in a Dutch, uh, one of the biggest Dutch banks. Uh, we are working for, with quality checks for these documents before they get processed. We are also improving uh, these documents uh, before they got extracted. Also, we are working in payslip uh, data extraction, signature data extraction, and uh, at the moment, other POCs related to computer vision. So let's uh, deep dive a little bit into our journey roadmap uh, for the theoretical presentation part of, uh, yeah. So we are going to start talking a little bit about what is computer vision, then uh, also talk about what we can achieve with it. Uh, how does it work in general terms? What are the current approaches to computer vision? Uh, we are going to have a look into morphological operations. That is one of the ways computer vision uh, works. And also a little talk about what machine learning can provide to computer vision. And we are going specifically to talk to a YOLO algorithm. Uh, that we are uh, going to use in our live code session. And after this, we are going for uh, the Q&A session uh, before moving to the live coding part. So what are the learning goals uh, from this session? Uh, we want 
that you at the end of this presentation will understand uh, the challenges that at the moment we face with computer vision, uh, some methods for image pre-processing. You also will understand uh, the basics of object detection and you will know the pros and cons of both methods and when they are usually being used. So we can start telling what's computer vision. Computer vision is a field of study focused on the problem um, helping computers to see and understand digital images as, and videos. It could be broadly uh, be uh, called a subfield of artificial intelligence and machine learning, uh, which may involve the use of specialized methods and make use of in general of uh, learning algorithms. Computer vision spans all the tasks that we have normally with uh, human related vision, including seeing, sensing uh, the visual stimulus, understanding what is being seen and extracting complex information into form that can be used later for processing. We can already say that computer vision is a broad term and there are difference between recognizing objects, images and uh, doing imaging processing. So uh, what can be achieved with computer vision? Um, well, a lot of things nowadays are really using computer vision already, but for example, uh, it enables self-driving cars uh, to make sense out of the surroundings. Uh, drive, self-driving uh, cars have cameras uh, with different angles and they process this information in real time uh, they read traffic signs and uh, detect other cars. Computer visual also plays, plays an important role in facial recognition. As we see, we have all these uh, filters in our, soft, uh, in, in our chat. Uh, we have our cell phones able to recognize our face to unlock. Also computer vision, uh, it's very important in augmented reality. Anyone that have played uh, Pokemon Go, a lot of games that actually enhance what we see uh, in the current uh, uh, world, adding extra features, but these features need to understand the surroundings and how things integrate together. Uh, also, it's less <laughs> fun, but very important. Computer vision allows us to understand scanned documents and written information in different types of scenarios. And uh, that's uh, one of the things we do the most in our current assignment, uh, trying to make sense of documents. Uh, so, yeah, I will let uh, Daniel uh, continue from here. Yes. All right, so uh, what I want to do is I want to start by uh, looking at how human version uh, works first. So um, if we start with a uh, high level description, then the first thing that happens uh, in human vision is, is that the light reaches your eyes. Then uh, these, uh, yeah, this stimulus goes to the visual cortex in the brain. And then finally, our brains make sense of what we see. And in this case, uh, in the picture, we see a tree. So if in contrast, we look at uh, the way that a computer visualizes things, um, we see that the process is quite different. So first of all, a computer does not have eyes, um, nor does it have a brain. Uh, it does have a memory, but unfortunately, computer memory and uh, human memory, uh, they are not very alike. So any type of imagery that we want computer to see uh, will have to be opened or loaded rather than to be observed. Then the image that is opened or uh, loaded is generally uh, represented by a grid of pixels, which are uh, stored into memory. And that looks a little bit something like this. So we may have, uh, in this case, uh, a very small 3 by 3 image. But every uh, pixel index in that array has a red, green, and a blue value. So if we consider uh, an image that we uh, have in high detail resolution, uh, it means that uh, this image is, for example, uh, 1920 by uh, 1080 pixels. Uh, if we were to calculate the total number of pixels in that image, yeah, it would add up to 1920 times 1080. 
And then you have for each pixel, a red, green, and a blue value, which amounts to a total of uh, 6.2 million pixels. Yeah, and that's quite a lot of information. So given these pixels, how can we be sure that once we've loaded this image, that we are actually looking at a tree here? So why is it hard for a computer to tell which area or which areas of this picture uh, embody the tree? But on contrast, it's quite easy for us to say so. Um, and the answer to that question is context. So, yeah, if we look at context, context is very important when it comes to, uh, to analyzing images. So our human brain is quite good at detecting patterns. Yeah, when we see something or when we experience something, uh, the event is stored in our memory. And if we encounter a similar experience in the future, uh, it's quite easy for us to uh, yeah, determine our course of action based on prior experience. So um, that means that for a computer, it is actually quite challenging to recognize the same kind of patterns that we are able to. Yeah, in short, that makes it that the goal of computer vision is to make a computer capable of recognizing features in, in images or in videos, just the way that we humans do. And yeah, the problem that we see is that in practice, it's actually quite difficult to train a computer to see, to think, uh, and also to interpret things like a human being. So yeah, there are some tools, some tricks that we can use to help the computer a little bit. And we will discuss two uh, computer vision approaches uh, during this talk. So uh, in computer vision, uh, there are two main approaches uh, that can be found. Um, on one hand, we have uh, morphological uh, operations. Uh, and on the other hand, we have uh, a machine learning approach. So uh, for both approaches, uh, the library OpenCV is quite commonly used. Um, OpenCV is a high-level abstraction framework. In simple terms, it just means that you can achieve quite a lot in uh, very few lines of code. Um, while all those operations are backed by quite complex uh, mathematical systems, usually the effects and the use cases are quite easy to follow because yeah, there's actually a visual result. If you apply a transformation to an image, you can show it, you see the output, you see what was changed in the image. So it's quite easy usually to follow along with uh, what these operations do. Uh, how they work, however, can be a little bit more complicated. Um, I don't have a background in complex math, uh, and I think that should be a testimony to the fact that I think that anyone with a computer science uh, background, given enough time, should be able to, uh, to pick this up. So. If we dive a little bit into how this works, um, we discussed already the uh, representation of an image. Uh, it's usually a two-dimensional array, and it has red, green, and blue uh, pixel values. But in general, when we deal with images in computer vision, we don't really care about specific colors. So rather than these uh, specific colors, speed is something that is uh, quite important. So when we deal with images, Often what we do is we uh, yeah, downscale the, the, the image to what is called a grayscale image. So essentially what this means is that we go from a red, green, and blue value to just a singular yeah, value, which is a, a grayscale, gray tone value. So this is a value, again, from 0 uh, ranging to 255. Uh, and uh, zero being black, 255 being white. Yeah, like I mentioned, it's uh, important because it actually makes it a lot faster. We have to process three times uh, less pixels in an entire image. So an example can be seen here. Uh, this is a very pixelated image of uh, Abraham Lincoln. Um, if we look at how this is represented as a, as a grayscale array, we see that each pixel has uh, a corresponding value to how uh, bright or how dark it is. And in the end, the, uh, yeah, the uh, representation just looks like a 2D array of numbers. So uh, from grayscale, 
Uh, what I want to do is discuss the next uh, operation uh, that is uh, used quite often, uh, which is called uh, binarization or uh, thresholding. So what we do once we convert our image to, uh, to grayscale is we can actually further decrease the complexity of this image uh, through a process called binarization. So what binarization means is, is that uh, in the end, we will be left with only two values. Either it's completely black or it's going to be completely white. Uh, what we can do is then we can pick a number between two, uh, 0 and 255 again. And this number is what we call the threshold. Um, and we can tell our program that uh, any value that falls below our threshold value, so if we go back here in this array, any number that is below, say, uh, if we take the middle, 127, is going to be black. And any value above 127 is going to be white. So uh, I have an example here on the right. We see that, let's assume that uh, the one on the left is our original image. It's just a gradient going from black to white, from left to right. So if we were to take a cutoff value uh, or a threshold value of 127, so in the middle, we see that in the first result, we get the left side is black, the right side is white. Um, and this method is just the inverse effect. So actually you just say, okay, rather than lower means black, higher means white, you inverse the effect. So you get lower is white and higher is black. So why is this used? Uh, well, we use it to increase the contrast between background and foreground. Uh, and in doing so, we can actually filter out, uh, again, more irrelevant data to just get very uh, concise, uh, more standing out features in an image. So uh, I have, uh, an example uh, of where it may not work so nicely. So we see here that uh, if we have the uh, original image, uh, it's a Sudoku picture, uh, but it's in grayscale. Uh, but we see that there's quite some shadow uh, that causes different lighting in different areas. So in this case, if we take a cutoff value of 127, what we actually see here is, is that the result is not so nice as the one on top, for example. Um, there's a solution to this, it's called adaptive thresholding. I think for the scope of this uh, talk, uh, um, we're not going to deep dive into how exactly it works, but just know that there's another way where instead of defining this threshold value yourself, there's also a way called adaptive thresholding, which can look at regional differences rather than uh, just take the whole image and define one value and cut it off there. Uh, and that actually uh, will ge uh, generate uh, a lot better results. Right, so for binarization, actually I have a, a small code example that I put together. So I uh, created a simple GUI tool. Uh, let me run this one. What I will do is I will move this here. So uh, let's first open the original. We have a... Dutch license plates uh, here, as we can see. Uh, so this is our original image. And what I want to do is I want to show you what happens if we uh, convert this to a grayscale and we change this cutoff value, so this threshold, uh, this threshold value. So if we load this image, we can see that, uh, well, it starts, say, here, like somewhere in the middle, right? So we see that we go from this original image on the right to this black and white image in this window right here. So to experiment a little bit with what happens, uh, if we go all the way here, well, we see that it becomes white. We see that it becomes black when it goes all the way here. And the reason being is, is because uh, the uh, values here are actually uh, inverted. But uh, you can see what this slider actually does when you move it around. As you see that, yeah, you can, even filter out like here the, the NL part of the uh, the license plate completely like this. If you do too much, you see it starts getting too aggressive and it will eat away from the from the black letters also. So this is in uh, in a nutshell what uh, binarization is. So you just uh, try to define a threshold and you say anything above this will become black or white, or vice versa. Right. So. 
There we go. So uh, the next topic that I want to discuss with you is uh, called um, erosion and dilation. So uh, in morphological approaches, something that is quite often uh, used is called um, a kernel. And uh, a kernel is something, uh, usually it looks something like this. Um, this in this case is a, a three by three cube, so to say. So um, if we look at the below kernel, um, if we look at the center of this, uh, of this cube, basically what these numbers tell us is how to transform something uh, in relation to its neighboring pixel, uh, pixels. So if we have this uh, center value right here, we're basically saying that all of these values are one, so there's sort of an even distribution uh, outwards. Um, so what we uh, do in this case is, is that from the center of this cube, we will apply the transformation to every neighboring pixel uh, uh, with a factor of one, for example. So there are two main methods here. So we have um, dilation and we have erosion. So what does this mean? So if we look at the, the character J that we have on the original image uh, on, the, on the left side here, um, if we apply um, dilation to it, sorry, it should be the opposite like this. If we apply uh, dilation to it, we see that actually the, uh, the pixels, the white pixels that make up the J in this case, they're dilated. So they uh, sort of expand outwards. Whereas the opposite effect, erosion, we actually sort of chip away parts of uh, this, these white pixels and we make the, uh, the mm, pixel regions move inwards, actually. So uh, to also give uh, a similar example, uh, I also have a, um, a code example of this, uh, again, with the Dutch license plate. So what we have seen is, uh, the original image, let me load it back here. So if we load in, this is just like the binarized uh, version, right? This is kind of where we left off in the, in the previous one. So uh, in this case, the cutoff value was uh, exactly in the middle. So we see quite a clean image here. So what actually happens is if, for example, we apply erosion or dilation, that actually it has a, an effect on uh, the thickness or uh, the way that the characters stand out with regard to their background. So in this case, we see erosion, we see the letters appear thicker, and we see dilation and we see the letters become thinner. So yeah, what's interesting, maybe if you have a keen eye, you spotted it, but um, what's actually interesting here is, is that um, I talked about erosion, which uh, of course takes away a part of um, uh, of the, 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 the pixel regions and dilation makes it thicker. Well, what we see here is actually the opposite. Uh, and the reason being is, is that because these operations, they work only on the, the white pixels in the uh, image. So they will not work on the black, but uh, only on the white. So if we look then at this example, erosion, it basically means takes it takes away some of the white pixels, and thus, in turn, it looks like the characters are bigger because there's more black. Uh, and the opposite, of course, is then true for dilation. If we expand the white area, we see that the characters become smaller. So in this case, again, uh, like I mentioned earlier, uh, the binarization is inverted here. All right. Then uh, the last morphological transformation that uh, we are going to discuss with you this uh, session is uh, blurring. So blurring an image is something that may be used to smooth out regions of uh, pixels or even an entire image. Again, this is achieved through a kernel. So again, we have uh, this cube here, for example. So we take, uh, we pick one pixel and then we say how much blur to apply to the neighboring pixels. And in this case, because everything is one, it's an even distribution. So this is what we call an average blur. Right. So the thing is, is that 
if we want to achieve vision, um, yeah, it sounds kind of counterintuitive to make an image blurry. And um, yeah, so the question is, uh, is this going to improve the quality? How is this going to improve the quality of uh, a document? Well, the answer is that uh, it really depends. Um, in itself, a blurry image is definitely not, uh, not improving the readability. Um, not really for humans, but yeah, similarly also, it's not going to make it any better for computers. But um, there are, however, cases where blurring can actually help with pre-processing. And one such example is a noisy image. So uh, noise just means that there is a distortion in the image quality, where usually you see like lots of grains and dots that cause interference in the image quality. So actually, it turns out that applying blur in these cases uh, can actually quite effectively remove noise. But yeah, at the same time, it does come at a price also. So while it makes it a little bit more uh, readable for a human, so if you take the, the picture here on the, on the right, we see that the original image, it's maybe a, hard, a little bit difficult to tell here, but uh, I also have a code example for this where it's, it's, well, a lot clearly, a lot more clearly visible. So here you see that there are some uh, dots, uh, a little bit of noise on the edges of these shapes and characters. And if you apply blur actually to the human eye, it will look more smooth. Uh, and also this, yeah, I think uh, is an effect that uh, you can also see in uh, some games, for example, where they use uh, anti-aliasing. So this really, uh, it, it's just a, a way of smoothing out certain details to make it look less uh, jaggy. Right, so um, the price that I was talking about, um, actually it does make it more readable for a human eye, but uh, for a computer we have a little bit of a problem because if we smooth something out, it means that the contrast between the foreign and background is also smoothed out. So the, the edges are a little bit uh, less detectable. So all in all, it means that uh, blurring is a tool that we should use scarcely, but uh, yeah, we really need to also consider when it does or does not improve readability. And by proving this, uh, I would like to uh, again show like an example to show a use case where actually this is quite useful. So I mentioned that uh, blurring is actually quite good at uh, removing noise from an image. So if we look at an example here, um, let's look at the original one. So we have here, uh, you can tell if I zoom in especially, yeah, this is very grainy, noisy. This is really a distorted uh, kind of image. So if we select this one, this is the uh, grayscale version of that image. So yeah, here we start seeing the problem with noise. If we binarize this and we just put the cutoff value in the middle, uh, this is what it looks like. And we see that the noise, some of it is filtered out but a lot of it actually persists even through binarization because yeah, there's just a huge variance also in, uh, in, in, in this pixel distribution. There's a lot of black and white interference. So if we want to achieve better, than, uh, better results than this, um, I think what we should do is uh, first take a step back. So we go back to this grayscale image. And then what we do next is uh, we actually blur this grayscale image. And yeah, I guess already from this uh, from this sub image, we can see that um, we see that a lot of the noise has been sort of cancelled out. It looks a lot smoother, but still, I think this on its own is still quite difficult for a computer to read. But let's have a look at what happens if you binarize it now. Well, then we see that the characters stand out a lot more actually, and we've effectively removed the noise from the image by binarizing it after applying uh, some blur to it. Yes, so um, we've covered all the morphological transformations. So uh, we've now arrived at the machine learning approach. And I think that the machine learning deep dive is a bit out of scope for this session, uh, especially due to time constraints. Um, but uh, what we will do is we will lay out 
all the basic concepts of uh, machine learning to you. And that should give you a pretty clear idea of how it works. So there are two, uh, two methods that we will discuss. The first one that uh, we're going to discuss is called uh, classification. So uh, with classification, what we mean is, is that we look at an image and we try to answer the question, uh, what am I looking at? Um, and a response might be, well, you're looking at a cat uh, or you're not looking at a cat. So the answer is quite binary. It's either a yes or a no. Uh, is it there? Yes. Or is it there? No. Uh, while it's useful if we want to determine what we're looking at, Usually what we also want to do is uh, we want to know uh, where something is in an image. So we also want an answer to the question, uh, where is it in the image? So uh, for that, we have localization. Um, so basically localization, what it does, so if we look at the example here, on the left side, we have classification. It just says, okay, this is a cat. But if we combine them, so we have classification and localization, it's able to tell if there is a cat, yes or no. And it can also give me sort of approximation where it is in, uh, in an image. But uh, the limitation here is, is that actually it only works for a single object. So we have another method, the second method that I want to discuss today. And uh, this one is called uh, object detection. So for object detection, we use uh, different classification modules and they each look for uh, different classes uh, of objects in, uh, in images. So it means that uh, it is able to detect more than one object in a single image. So we are not so much concerned with the question, uh, is this object present? But it's more of an agnostic use case where we want to identify a, a list of objects that are present in an image. Uh, in the next few slides, actually, you will see some examples also that will uh, make this uh, a little bit more clear to you. So the last one that we have is uh, instance segmentation. Uh, if we look at the, the example image in here, and we see that object detection is able to detect cats, dogs, and ducks. Uh, and usually how this works is, is that people have trained models to recognize these things. But we see that it's able to pick up different kinds of objects uh, in a single instance of an image. Instance segmentation, uh, what we try to achieve here is, is we try to uh, yeah, sort of um, find the enclosed shape, what we call the, the, the convex hull of an object. So uh, we really try to isolate uh, the or approximate, uh, approximate the full coordinates like the, the, uh, that, that embody this, uh, this object. Right, so um, let's look back on what we know so far and let's compare some things. So uh, the two categories that we are going to uh, compare with each other is uh, on one hand, we have pre-processing. So those are all the, the techniques that I explained at the start. Then we have object detection and object detection um, on the other hand uh, is a totally different, uh, different use case as we will see in this comparison. So it turns out that pre-processing uh, is not really so good for recognizing complex features. Um, what it is quite good at, however, is, uh, is optimization for achieving computer vision. Um, so if we find the location of, say, uh, a license plate on a car, well, there are some tricks that we can, uh, can use to actually make the characters uh, more readable, for example. On the other hand, uh, object detection is quite good at recognizing complex features, uh, also yeah, different kinds or multiple features inside images. Um, but it may not always be sufficient for achieving computer vision on its own. So if we think back to, for example, the noisy license plate that we saw earlier, well, it's clear that simply locating an object is not always enough for example, to make it readable by, uh, say, an OCR engine. If you are able to isolate the license plates, but it's very noisy, the quality is uh, rather bad, uh, still you will have a hard time trying to read it. So uh, yeah, I think we can summarize it by saying that uh, they each have different use cases, uh, but in the end, uh, they complement each other. So often you will see that uh, you will be using both uh, rather than either one. 
then um, yeah for the for the last part of the uh, uh, after the presentation we will be doing a, a live coding workshop and uh, during this workshop we will be using a framework that is called uh, YOLO and YOLO stands for you only look once um, it is an object detection uh, algorithm and it helps us to answer the questions uh, what and where in an image. In short, this means that uh, yeah, we feed an input image to uh, YOLO. It will use something called a convolutional neural network to generate predictions of what objects are present in the picture. Um, and yeah, that will look a little bit something like this. So let's have a look at an example. In this picture, for example, we see that uh, multiple objects are identified. Traffic lights, uh, people, trucks, cars, uh, and yeah, if you have a keen eye, then here you see even a handbag, so a very specific thing. Um, it doesn't do so out of the blue, um, because uh, yeah, recognizing these things, usually what you see is that people train uh, machine learning models to recognize these things. Uh, and this part is a little bit something, uh, maybe a little bit abstract, but um, what I do want to do is try to explain on a high level uh, what YOLO does and how it works. So let's assume that we have the picture on the left as, as an input image. Um, this is somewhat of a ske yeah, simplified schematic overview. So uh, we can see that the image on the left is actually segmented into a grid. And if we send this picture to YOLO, it will do two things. And again, this is oversimplified, but uh, just to visualize it a little bit. So the first thing it will do is it will look for uh, the object's location, and it will try to rate each box with a confidence score. So in the end, we see that we get a dog, a bicycle, and a car that are highlighted in this image. Um, but how we get there, yeah, how does that work? Thing is probably someone spent uh, yeah, quite some time uh, on a process called image labeling. So what image labeling is, is uh, generally what you have is, uh, let's say that you want to be able to recognize dogs in images. Um, what you will see then is, is that uh, someone has, for example, say a thousand images that do have dogs in them. Uh, and on the other hand, they also have a thousand images where there are no dogs in, uh, in the picture. In the pictures where there is a dog, they will manually, uh, yeah, sort of label the location of that, uh, of that dog and they put them in yeah, just an oversimplified example again, but you have a positives folder and a negatives folder. So every picture that has a dog, you highlight it, you put it there. Every picture that doesn't have a dog, you put it in a negatives folder. And basically that is used as input for training a machine learning model. So in the end, uh, it will actually, because of all the examples, will be better at recognizing when a dog is found in an image. And uh, this process usually is repeated for each class. So, and by class, I mean different type of objects, so a bicycle, a car, a dog. Um, then, in the end, some filters are applied and uh, some of the objects are localized. Uh, so if you look at the bottom, for example, you see that there's a class probability map. Um, and what we see here is that some tiles in the grid are highlighted with a certain color to indicate where possibly uh, it thinks that, uh, that one of these objects may be. Um, and then in conjunction with the, uh, the above uh, example that it's trying to locate the, the bounding boxes and the confidence, it comes up with a prediction where it says, for example, I don't know, this is, uh, I'm 84% sure that this is a dog or I'm 90% sure that this is uh, a bicycle. Right, so um, like I mentioned, I don't want to go too much into detail because this really is something that uh, could take up a whole talk on its own. Uh, but I'm just trying to lay out the fundamentals because we will be using uh, YOLO to recognize uh, license plate in cars. 
Um, so what we will actually show is uh, YOLO in action during the live coding session. Um, yeah. Uh, let me think. Um, yeah, I think now. I think that's for now. Uh, that's all I want to say about YOLO. Um, then finally, what I would like to do is offer some time for uh, Q and A. Um, so if you have any questions at this moment, uh, feel free to uh, put them in the chat. Uh, Rodrigo and I will do our best to, uh, to answer them. Uh, so yeah, I'm looking forward to what you, uh, what you have to hear so far before we move on to the, uh, to the workshop. Hello. Hey, Rodrigo, also here. Hey. So I have a few uh, questions written down. Um, Let's start with uh, 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 yeah. I'll, I'll just go to try to do them in a kind of order, but uh, it's 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 rather randomized here in, uh, on post. So uh, here we here we go. Uh, does a higher resolution image help the compute uh, visioning tool? Sometimes, <laughs> actually, Sometimes. Yeah, actually, uh, there is a threshold. Uh, when the images have very low resolution, it's really hard to find information. But as uh, they grow bigger, actually, they put a lot of stress on the systems, and most of the systems are tailored to with certain amount of resolution. So some in between. Uh, so what we usually cannot do is uh, like increase resolution when we have lower resolution. Uh, images, but if they are too big, uh, we usually uh, lower down uh, in, in resolution to be able to process. Also, every uh, pixel that we add to the image adds more uh, stress to the system, and it doesn't directly correlate with uh, better uh, results. It is to a certain degree. Cool, cool. That's good. Okay, I got another one that just popped in. Any idea what happens when you sharpen a blurred image? Does it return to the previous state or does it smooth out? Yeah, this one uh, is an interesting one. So um, you mentioned sharpen a blurred image. Huh? So uh, what I discussed during the talk is that if you have a noisy image, you can apply blur to it and it will fix the, the noise that's, uh, that's in this image. Uh, so what's actually funny is, is that if you have a blurry image, um, yeah, sharpening is like a tool that you have, for example, also in uh, like Photoshop, for example. But actually, sharpening, uh, ironically, is not uh, the uh, the opposite of blurring. So uh, if you want to make an image that is very blurry, sharp, uh, it sounds very strange, but you have to add noise to it. So it can be like something like Gaussian noise or something. But um, yeah. To make a blurry image sharper, you have to add noise. Um, and again, like I mentioned during the during the blur part, also is that if you try to denoise an image by adding blur, it comes at a price. But also the opposite is true. So if you have a blurry image and you add noise, you can imagine what effect that has on the readability of uh, yeah of um, of an image. So if you take an image and you you blur it. Um, Usually, it's something that if you want to read characters from it, uh, especially if you have like a small document, uh, then you actually, it's kind of a hopeless situation because you cannot really fix it. You can make it more readable for human, but not really for the computer. So blur and noise are quite uh, detrimental to the, uh, to the progress of uh, sort of the performance of uh, computer vision techniques. Uh, sharpness is also like enhancing the contours of, of the image. It's not related to the opposite, to blurriness. Yeah. And how do you then uh, um, let the, 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 the program decide when it has to go to, it has to do some sharpening or blurring? Uh, yeah, I can explain maybe a little bit based on uh, what, uh, what we do currently. Yeah? So what we try to do is we just try to detect if there is any blur. Um, and the thing is, is that what I mentioned is that if you try to to correct it, actually, even though you might think that you make it more readable because you are able to uh, read it better as a human being, it 
probably because you add noise, all these kinds of random dots mm -hmm. everywhere, it's going to make it still quite hard for a computer to read it. So it's something that turns out to be quite difficult to fix. So what we actually do is, is we try to uh, say at the upload stage, we try to say, uh, hey, we see that this document is quite blurry. Um, maybe you want to reconsider uploading, because otherwise we have to look at it manually. Ah, OK. Interesting. That's cool. And uh, another question, but this is more on the machine learning part. How much images are needed for a machine learning system to start recognizing it properly? So probably with three images is not enough, but uh, I don't yeah. know. Like it's usually a couple of hundreds, uh, thousands should be your target. Um, it makes it really hard uh, for, for things like uh, in real case scenarios when you're working with customers and you're training your machine learning model uh, with data that is, for example, real life documents that are related to customer data, you cannot use that. And it, it, it makes it really hard. Uh, there are certain shortcuts because you have pre-trained models. Usually you don't train a model from scratch. You use a train model and you retrain it on top of it and that usually require less amount of uh, samples but yeah at least should be 100 or 200 and you always need to keep some of these uh, samples for actually validating your model so it should usually be should be like 20 percent of your uh, samples uh, shouldn't be used to train the model but to test it ah, yeah. okay interesting and daniel there was also a question popping up for you we missed a cat <laughs> yeah, I don't know where she went, uh, but uh, she decided I have a glass of water here, and uh, she decided that uh, that glass of water was hers. So, <laughs> so immediately a follow up question about that. Then. Do you have like a home project going on where you're trying to recognize your cat in certain? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I don't actually. No, no, no. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> cool. Then I have one, but that's probably a tricky question. Uh, um, you, you all know Captcha, right? Are yes. we training CAPTCHA with the computer vision technology by clicking everything? Well, <laughs> Google has a big image database that I can you, you sh actually you can use for training your own models. It's free. And you can search for almost every object that you can imagine. And there are already images that are tagged there. So I don't know where they get those from. <laughs> so okay. maybe it's from the CAPTCHAs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you never know, right? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> okay, cool. So I see just uh, another question pop in, popping in from uh, Sheriff Sahin. Uh, I, I believe I once opened CV for facial recognition and for reliable results, the sweet spot number was 50 or so. Does it differ too much from facial recognition to document recognition? Uh, well, that depends on what type of document you are working on. Uh, and, uh, for example, if you just want to, in a passport, recognize uh, where uh, the regions of interest are, let's say the, the machine readable zone or like where the name or that type of thing, maybe 50, it's too little. Uh, it has a lot of variation. Uh, you will probably need more samples if it's uh, similar, uh, I'd say the other way around. For example, passport, 50 could be okay. So that depends. Uh, there are documents that uh, are pretty much well structured, so you actually spend expect to find information in the same site uh, area and that is easier uh, but if you have a big variation between uh, the the different samples then you will need like a bigger uh, training sample so so basically uh, the more the better <laughs> The more the better, uh, but yeah, that depends. If it, you are using something that is pretty much similar in every case, so there is no big variation, as I said, like passports, uh, then a smaller uh, like sample is okay. Uh, but if you have something that changes a lot, let's say it's not a document, but like, like a flower or a chair or something that, well, there could be so many different uh, models of it, uh, then you will need a bigger uh, sample size. Great, great to hear. So um, then um, I have only one uh, question left for the audience, basically. And uh, uh, I hope you all can uh, put something in in the live chat in uh, what was your experience, first experience uh, using computer vision or even uh, just trying it out. It can be so sim such a simple thing as just having a photo camera. Just that we know uh, uh, what you are doing with computer vision. 
and then um, I hope to see those uh, comments soon. And then we can immediately move over to uh, Rodrigo for the live coding, right? Yeah. Um, so let's start. Uh, first of all, I think that I share with uh, uh, in the chat uh, with a, a link uh, to our current tool that we are going to use. And for you that doesn't know, don't know this tool, uh, this is a Google Collab, and this is a Google Collab uh, notebook. Google Collab actually is a free tool that allows us to run a Python code uh, from the web up uh, from scratch. You don't need to register or anything. You just can use it uh, with your Google account. And uh, it also allows us to have virtual machine uh, for ourselves. Uh, it is uh, in, in, in the background a Jupyter notebook service uh, that requires no use, uh, no setup. And we have actually assigned a memory and disk space and a, like a, yeah, like, like an archive system, everything without doing, needing to do anything. Um, this is my notebook. So if you want to make changes on it, you just go to your file folder and put like save a copy in Drive and it will save in your own Google Drive. If you don't have a Google Drive, you can make an account of it. Um, then you will be able to edit. But anyways, if you don't want to edit, you can still play around with this. So. Let's start with the workshop Roma. Uh, what we are going to do, since this is like already running machine, we are going to install uh, Tesseract. That is the OCR in tool that we are going to use. I, I forgot to mention that in this workshop, we want to recognize license plates and then extract the data from those uh, license plates. So uh, for the OCR in part, we are going to use Tesseract and then we have a uh, repository that we have in uh, GitLab uh, that uh, has a pre-trained machine learning model for YOLO and some of the code that then you can play around uh, by yourself. And we have also some Python dependencies. Those are all the prerequisites from our machine. If you have here uh, the prerequisite pre section and uh, you just press play, it will install everything in a couple of minutes. Uh, if you see here, I already have everything installed, but it doesn't take more than a couple of minutes. And after that, after installing the prerequisites, uh, we are going to go to two different parts uh, to achieve our goal. Uh, that is a detection and abstraction. First, we want to find an image uh, license plate. Then we want to isolate that uh, part of the image where the license plate is, and then we want to run extraction uh, process to get out the text of it using uh, Tesseract OCR. So let's get started. Uh, for the install the prerequisites, we will need uh, Tesseract OCR. It is not installed in our machine by default. We need to clone our repository and then only install two Python dependencies that are OpenCV uh, 4.5 and PyTesseract that will allow us to actually communicate with Tesseract that is a library uh, that is not only for Python. We have Python bindings for it. So if we can see here, actually you see that uh, you can run, uh, run uh, command line codes as so it will be like a machine. Uh, if I will just run this at this moment, it will tell me that um, I already have my uh, data checked out. Then we need to clone the repository, and this repository is where the machine learning models are. And then we need to install uh, the Python dependencies. Once this has been done, uh, you have at the left side a nice uh, navigation bar where you find like a folder. And if you click there, you actually will see your uh, like uh, directory system in, in, in the virtual machine. Uh, these machines, uh, by the way, will be available to you as long as you use them. And after some time that you are away from the keyboard or not using, they can be recycled. So uh, the things in this uh, uh, file system uh, will be removed and then you will need to run your uh, notebook again. So you see here that we have our folder uh, with the Git repository and it has two folders and some files. Uh, in the data folder, uh, we find, uh, first of all, a weights file that is our 
preterm machine learning model. Uh, the names file that actually has the list of all the objects that our preterm model can handle. In this case, it's only license plates and some configuration file we use uh, for uh, working with Jolo. In the image folder, we have two pictures that we are going to use uh, to test our extraction uh, code and detection. We have some document uh, images that we use in this uh, notebook. And we have two uh, files uh, with Python code, detect and extract. Uh, we are going to go through uh, the detect part that uses machine learning, uh, just to explain what's the idea behind and let it, you play with it. And we are going to write our instruction code and explain step by step what we are going to do. Uh, but you also have like a extract version here uh, for you to, to play with it. And then we have just a utils uh, class with some uh, handy methods that we want to type over and over again. So let's get started. Uh, so we start with the detection part and we see here that I, draw a small roadmap about what we are going to do in the detection part. In the detection part, uh, we first need to load using OpenCV our train model plus uh, the YOLO configuration file, and that will generate uh, for us an OpenCV detector. This detector needs an image as an input to detect the objects uh, on that image. So the first thing we are going to get is our image, but then we need to convert this image into a blob uh, that uh, it's a group of connected pixels in a binary format that is actually the way it needs to be input for the detector. Once we do that, we will run the detector and we will get a set of predictions. That means uh, it's like a collection of regions of interests of areas with predictions uh, values saying uh, the objects that were found and uh, the accuracy of the prediction. After that, we are going to uh, simplify the overlapping results because predictions usually come in, in sets. So there are going to be several that probably are overlapping. And that will end up with uh, regions of interest. So the areas where the things we are looking for are, in this case, uh, it's just license plates. And um, we are going to output two things. Uh, the first one is the full image uh, with the region of interest uh, shown. So we show where we found uh, the license plate. And for that, we are going to use a class file uh, that has the name of the objects that we find. Uh, in our case, since we are only training our model to find one object, that name will be license plate. Uh, but if your model is trained to recognize different type of objects, you need, will need a class file uh, with the names of each of those objects. So then you can correlate the findings with the name. And then we will save our crop uh, region of interest in a, another file that we will use as input for our next step that will be uh, extracting the data out of the license plate. Okay, so let's get started. Uh, first of all, we are going just to take a look to our detect file. As you can see also, Collab allows us to uh, in live uh, edit our code and see it as a, both like an IDE. Actually, it's not only uh, highlighting uh, the code, but also allows us to, to type and predict what we want to, to have uh, from different objects. It's very nice. So uh, as I said, I will go just roughly through the detect method because it has a little bit more complexity based on uh, the machine learning part. And then we will go a little bit more in depth in the extraction part. So. Uh, first of all, we have our main function where we will pass a file name that we want to use for detection. Uh, then we have a detection config uh, class that I use to save some information where my classes uh, are, classes, as I mentioned, where the names or labels for the objects we train our model, where our model is also located, the configuration for YOLO, 
Uh, then these are uh, some configuration values we are going to discuss a little bit in the future. And these are just colors we use to uh, show the regions of interests. So the first part of our process is load the detector. Uh, for loading the detector, uh, I have a convenience method here. That's a low YOLO detector that will allow uh, to just using OpenCV to read uh, the convolutional neural network, given a path and uh, begin the configuration path and the, the weights path or the train mode. The second part of it then is uh, uh, reading the image that we want to actually make use of. And then we are reading also the labels for the objects that we can find. As I said uh, in uh, my previous explanation, we really need uh, for this uh, convolution neural network to work. The image transform in uh, this blob that is a group of connected pixels or regions uh, in a vision via binary image. And then we need to set them as input uh, from our detector. Once uh, we set them as input, then we are going to get output layers or like predictions with different regions with different amounts of uh, accuracy uh, found. So I have a convenience uh, method for this. It's just a detector getting the layer name and asking the detectors to output the layers. These are going to actually return to us um, a certain uh, amount of regions or coordinates where the possible objects we are looking for are located. So once we have our predictions, uh, we are going to get the boxes for those predictions, the level of confidence of the model, and the IDs of uh, the objects. Uh, that means that, if, for example, if I have 80 different objects, and uh, let's say that cat is like object zero, uh, I will get like uh, the ID zero if it finds a cat, if I will get like ID 10 if 10 is a car or whatever. So I will get a list of uh, different regions. How confident is that the object that it actually found is the object that uh, thing it is? And uh, the ID of those classes so then we can correlate with the name. Um, then what will happen, I will just switch here, is that usually we'll, uh, we will get a set of uh, regions of interest that overlap here. For example, if you see this image, you will see uh, that the person is being found, found uh, like three different times and it has different levels of confidence. But we, in the end, want to uh, remove all the overlapping uh, boxes and just get the best of them and the same for the dog. So we apply a non-maximum suppression algorithm. Uh, that it's a little bit hard to explain at this moment, but in uh, like a nutshell is selecting the best bounded boxes for the object and re rejects or suppress all the other boxes that are not uh, the best match. So uh, in the detect part again, uh, we will go here. And we have the indices or uh, the best matching candidates for the objects we are looking for. After this, uh, we have coordinates. And the coordinates, we are just going to get uh, the x, the y, how width, and the, the height of the object. And then we will crop the image. Um, this is our original image. And we are going just to copy it uh, out and then draw a bounding box on top of it. We have a convenience image um, method uh, that allows us to save the image and we will call it detection Roy. And we have uh, it uh, again going to save the detection crop. So what we are going to do is in the, the original image, draw a box around our uh, found data and uh, then also we are going to crop the image and save it uh, separately for the next step that we are going to do a little bit more in detail. So after reviewing the code, uh, then we have here uh, 
the execution of the code itself. What we are going to do is make sure that we are in the folder with the code it is. And then we are going to execute Python, our detect code. We are going to feed one of the two images we have as sample here, this car one. And what we are actually going to do is in the same line, uh, execute Python code to show those two images. So if I run it now, it actually found the boxes uh, where the uh, code it is. And there we are. Uh, this is the image of our car. I forgot to show it. Taking a while to load. Yeah, because it's big. Yeah, you see, this is the original one. And uh, then we have uh, the region of interest uh, mark in the original uh, file. This is quite a big image. This is uh, the, the size in pixels. And then we have our uh, region of interest crop. Those are the two files. So now we also have a new folder that is called out. And the folder will uh, have the detection crop and the detection region of interest. So if we open it, actually it's the image uh, that we just saw in the code. So uh, this was the part of uh, the detection. So let's move to extraction and go a little bit on into it. So what we are going to do in the destruction part? Well, uh, now that we have actually the area that we want to start looking into, that's our crop our region of interest, uh, we are going to go to like four stages uh, before we can actually track uh, three stages and destruction itself using uh, the OCR in tool. Uh, the first of it will be pre-processing. So we take the image, reduce the amount of information, make it clear, uh, well, reduce the amount of information, but grayscale scale in it. We resize it a bit to make it easier for the OCR in tool to extract the text out of the, of the uh, license plate. We we'll blur it, it just a bit to remove any possible noise that may happen in the image. We threshold and dilate the image as uh, thresholding allows us to mark a little bit more the boundaries of different objects in the image so we can extract them, dilate them to make uh, their areas a little bit thicker. Uh, we are going to detect all the objects in the image using counter detection. Then we have a little set of regions of interest, different objects that are in our license plate that may be something that we want to use. After that, we are going to do some small heuristic filtering. That means just using plain logic to understand how we can actually filter those objects, the ones that we don't want from the ones we want. And in the end, we will uh, end up having individual regions of interest, uh, each letter in the license plate. We will invert them because uh, for the thresholding, we were using the inverse binary image. So we will get it back with white background, black uh, foreground, blur it a little bit again to remove any noise, send it to the OCR engine to extract, and then show the license plate number. So uh, let's get started. Uh, for any of you that want to run it, uh, this you can actually do this, but we are going to write some uh, live code here. So I'm going to start yeah, a little bit uh, below. We can, uh, yeah. So first of all, uh, we will need to use a PyTesseract uh, and also OpenCV. And uh, I, oh, and we also have uh, utils uh, method that will allow us to show the plot image. So uh, our first step will be reading the original image. And for this, uh, what we are going to do is create a variable and use OpenCV to read that image uh, here and then just put the location of it. It's in data out detection 
and crop keep that. Yeah. Okay. Once we have this image, as I say, we need to convert it in grayscale. Grayscale. Because we really don't want all the information that comes uh, with it. So for that, we are also again using OpenCV. And it's like CB2, CBT color, if I remember well, image, uh, the original image. And then uh, we are going to transform from color VGR uh, to gray. Um, I'm not sure if I mentioned, but uh, OpenCV images are not R RGB, they are VGR. Uh, it's a little bit. Uh, twisted uh, the, the colors. So once we have our great uh, size image, what we are going to do actually is resize it, make it a little bigger so it is easier uh, for the uh, extraction process to work. And we are going to do it three times bigger than it was. Uh, it also, we will have interpolated Interpolation and it will be uh, CB2 interpolation cubic. Uh, enter cubic, if I'm not wrong. And then uh, we are going to show what we did uh, just to the grass of it. Yeah. Great image. So if we run this now we will see the image that has been loaded and converted to gray. So let's keep uh, executing. So as I said, let's go back to our uh, roadmap. We say grayscale, resize, and blur. So apply blurring to remove any noise. Uh, in this case, we don't have a lot, but still uh, it's important to do it because we don't know uh, the quality of the images. So uh, we are going to do, uh, oops, sorry, medium blue. And uh, for the medium blue, we are going to use our grayscale image and convert it with, uh, yeah, matrix of three, blue, and then we are going to put our blur image there. Uh, so after this, uh, what, comes here is a thresholding and dilating our image. So thresholding actually, it helps us to uh, partition the image in different segments uh, so we can recognize individual objects on it. Uh, so for that, we are going to use threshold brush in a method cv2 threshold yeah. and we are going to take a blur image and uh, make uh, the cut process and we are going to use a specific uh, threshold and method that it is uh, otsu um, as daniel explained in a theory in theory uh thresholding is the Pot, cutting point where all the pixels will turn black or all the pixels will turn white. And if we do just a normal thresholding, what will happen sometimes is that if the image has too many different areas with shadows, it could get too dark or some of the information get lost. And uh, the type of adaptive thresholdings would allow us to take uh, the desired which color will be black or white, depending on each specific sub area of the image. So it will be better. So uh, five and then C2, because we also want not only to threshold it, but we want to threshold in inverse binary. That means that our uh, whites will be black and our blacks will be white. And then we will show the plot of it and threshold. And we'll show this. Yeah. Okay. So let's uh, run it and see how it goes. If I haven't made any mistake. Yeah. Okay. 
So you see here uh, the blue version really does not change a lot. And you have the threshold version, binarize invert. That means that all the black pixels re uh, convert into white and the other way around. Cool. So let's continue. After uh, the thresholding, uh, we want to apply a uh, dilation to enhance a little bit uh, our area. And for that, uh, we need a kernel. Um, a kernel uh, for dilation, uh, it's a little bit uh, hard to explain, but it's a mathematical process where we are going to multiply each one of our pixels uh, to change their neighboring areas. Um, so in this case, we are going to get structural structuring element that actually is getting a kernel for our calculations. Uh, more correct if I do not do that. Yeah. And then we need kernel size of three, three by three. Uh, this at the moment, it's a little bit hard to explain, but just take like this, it will help us to thicken out a little bit uh, our uh, image. So for the dilation, we are going to use a dilate method. Uh, we need a threshold image. Image. Uh, we need our rect uh, kernel, and we also will need a number of iterations. Iterations. Uh, that is going to be only one. And then we are going also to show this uh, here, just to see how it goes, and. Um, then once we have the image here dilated, we want to start extracting the different objects in the image. And that's why we are going to create, uh, find the contours of the image. For this, find the contours of the image. Uh, for this, we are going to use, um, it, uh, we are going to use a CV2 method that is called find contours. Uh, what this method will do is uh, um, return a tuple. Uh, it will return the contours at the hierarchy. Uh, sometimes there are objects embedded in other objects. Uh, and also for us, it's important to know the hierarchy because we want like the higher level contours, not uh, the inner elements of it. Uh, so what we are going to do is uh, use the dilation, dilated version of the image. Uh, this is a retrain. This is uh, the tree of contours means uh, the, we have a hierarchical representation of elements in the matrix. Uh, we don't need to care a lot about that at this moment. And it's a change box symbol. Okay, so once we have all the contours, uh, we just need to sort them out. Uh, sorted contours. And for that, we need to use the sorted operation uh, just to have the higher level contours and and forget about the rest. And we have like a lambda here. This is again, don't worry much about this. It's just uh, filtering a little bit all uh, the bounding boxes around different objects and just getting the higher level of them. Uh, bounding rect. And uh, it should be, uh, yeah. It's, uh, this is a little bit, uh, okay. So once we have all our contours, uh, we actually have found different objects in our image. And um, let's uh, show them a little bit because otherwise it's a little bit uh, difficult to image. So uh, we are going to iterate all these contours. Contours yeah, for each, uh, Contour, uh, 
are four counter I mean sorted counters, sorry. And what we are going to get is uh, for each counter its location, x, y, y, width and height, uh, cd2, uh, boxes, band direct, sorry, uh, for each counter. And then we need to draw a rectangle on top of the image so we can show actually the objects we have found. Uh, in this case, uh, we use uh, CV2, oh, sorry, rectangle. And in this rectangle, uh, what we are going to use is, uh, we got to put it here. I'm going to be, uh, make image choice. It, I'm going to create a new image, so I'm not going to draw on top of my original image. I will just uh, copy it. Uh, so I will draw on this, and it will be in X, Y position. Uh, it will uh, then, I need to, the initial and end point of it, it will be X uh, plus width, uh, and Y, plus height and then i need to use a color here just to show let's use red uh, this is rgb colors and then just uh, the width of the bounding boxes to show so uh it's too big let's uh, do four and after that uh, we can show plot and uh, and uh, uh, yeah, English rice. Which is Roy. Okay, let's try to run it, see if it does not uh, file. Uh, okay, this is uh, the Lambda one. I did it wrong here. Uh, we have counters. Okay, wow, well, okay. okay. Miss type lambda. Uh, it's running. Cool. So we have our uh, gray version, the blur. After that, the threshold. After that, uh, the oh, sorry, I forgot that I actually resized the image. So uh, the original image image uh, we have here has been resized. So I will take this one here and. Uh, yeah, image Royce, uh, because the coordinates are based on the uh, original image. That means that uh, it, uh, it, uh, they are uh, like uh, out of uh, size in this moment. So let's play it again. Okay, and we see here that we have different objects of regions of interest, but it is a little bit too much. So if uh, we see here, we can see also, we have the letters that we care about, but also we have all these small points. Uh, we have the even like bigger bounding box. We have all the stars of the European Union and these letters that we don't care about. So uh, at the moment we have using machine learning for detection. Uh, we are using uh, morphological operations to then find different objects in the image. But after all of this, we still need to use our common sense, logic or heuristics uh, to think about what we want to filter out from this. So uh, I have like here a sketch uh, of the image and we say, well, I have all these other objects I don't care about, so I need to filter them out. How am I going to do it? Well, I came up, but this is like a, just a empiric solution that uh, the regions that I care about should be at least one third of the total image size. So that will filter out all these small dots here. And also the spec ratio between them should be 1.2. Uh, that means that uh, the, it needs to be taller than wide. And we can also 
have a minimum area because uh, sometimes maybe the spec ratio is that, but still is too thin. We don't care about it. Um, so what we are doing here now to, to do is like uh, lower down or filter uh, the amount of results uh, here in this part is the heuristic filtering. That is just a fancy word to say, well, I need to think how I'm going to uh, filter this using some common sense logic. And this is very common in computer vision. Uh, there are a lot of different things we need to join to have a complete solution for it. So let's go here in our uh, part. So for we have first of all in our list, oh, sorry. Yeah, we have first, uh, uh, yeah, in the heuristic filtering, sorry. Uh, we have the spec ratio. That's the first part we are going to do. So uh, for the spec ratio, we need to know the full size of the image. So we have the height and the width of the full image. And we are going to use a method that is called, uh, well, it's actually just a property from the image uh, that is shape. And uh, this uh, property will actually, it's a tuple that has three values. If it's a color image, it will have the height, uh, the width, and uh, the color depth. So we don't care about the last one, so I just put like an underscore there, uh, not make use of it. So. The first uh, part of it is like the uh, aspect ratio, right? So I will say the ratio equals uh, the height of uh, the current uh, region of interest divide uh, the width. And uh, well, this is, uh, I don't need the, the height uh, and height of the image for that. And I will say that if the ratio is uh, less than 1.2, uh, or the ratio is too big also, bigger than two. I just will skip this one. And uh, then uh, we also don't want that the box is like bigger than a quarter of the whole image. So for that, what we will do is if height, I'm oh, sorry, height, uh, height uh, divide the height of uh, the current region of interest is greater than three. I will also skip it, I will not continue. And then we have uh, one more that uh, it's, uh, what was it? Maybe we can just get it here. So let's run it and see what it gets. So that's all the regions of interest we have now execute the code again and see if it improves. Cool, much better. Now we have only uh, the letters. Uh, all the other elements have been uh, removed. So uh, we can also add a little bit more. We can add uh, the, the total uh, area of the object, uh, but in this case, it worked quite well. So. After drawing the rectangle, uh, what we actually want to do is uh, to get these regions of interest, the small images, and pass them uh, to uh, our OCR engine to read them, because that's our final goal. So what we are going to do is uh, yeah, get our ROI or ROI image. Let's call it like this. This is actually uh, the region of the image of the region of interest. And um, what we are going to do is use our threshold image and put it uh, in small piece that we want. So uh, we are going to have y and y plus height, and then uh, x, uh, and then x plus width. And that will take us like a small bit of it. Uh, but we don't really want to just cut the, the letter, we want to take a little bit more just to be sure that we are uh, getting the whole of it. So I will set up like a just arbitrary padding. And what this arbitrary padding will let me do is like cutting a little bit more 
at the size of it, each image so I uh, have a little bit better grasp. So white is padding, white plus uh, let's take image padding, high plus, oh. yeah, uh, plus padding. And then we have X minus padding and X plus width plus padding. Uh, that should uh, uh, that should give us like a little bit better view here. And uh, then what we are going to do here is now that we have it, we have the inverse version. If you see here, uh, uh, the this is uh, the, the current source of our uh, crop. So we are going to invert back to its original uh, form. And this is going to be uh, CB2, twice not, uh, that will uh, revert it. And it will be the Roy image. So we have uh, the, the, the original uh, not inverted version. And uh, we are going to be a little bit uh, conservative and are a little bit of medium blur. That's just, again, removing a little bit of noise. So uh, right image. And then we are just going to leave five as uh, the kernel that we want to do. So just to show this uh, for construction purposes, uh, individual letter, and then we can do this and see if it works. Okay, what was it? Oh yeah, there's a wrong character there. No. You see all the individual characters uh, being extracted. Uh, so it's quite a lot. Well, and this moment I will just like comment it out because it's too much to show. And then we are going to get the text itself. So for that, what we are going to do is uh, like plain text here, have initial empty variable. And then what we are going to do is uh, have like text equals by uh, Tesseract, that is a tool to call our OCR in tool image to string that will uh, transform, I will read uh, our image into one string and then I will do, well, sorry, Roy image. And I will give a configuration value to Tesseract. Uh, give me a second. This is, I need to copy and paste because it's very long. But uh, essentially we are going to tell Tesseract uh, that we are not working with any specific language because in this case, we really don't care about language. And we have a wide list of characters. So we are only going to tell our OCRN uh, machine that we are only caring for numbers and letters. And then we have our text. So what we are going to do then is uh, from the play text, text, uh, we are going to join it in text. And in the end, we are going to print it out. And let's see if it does not explode. Cool. So let's see. And we have here P5, 8, B, P, S. And uh, we finally did the whole uh, extraction um live um that's uh, pretty much it uh, to show it uh, so after you saw in any case that we apply computer vision usually only one solution or one approach is not enough we need uh, to join them together and in the end of that we need to work a little bit through our heuristics or like common sense to make uh, a little bit more filter of the data and um, the very important part of this is the pre-processing, how I prepare the image to get recognized. And of course, tools like the OCR in tools are, are also very essential, but then can vary in quality 
uh, but it's up to us to make uh, the most uh, perfect uh, image before sending it to, to tools like the OCR instruction part. Um, in the end, uh, you can use this call for yourselves, copy it. I uh, will uh, share with you the link uh, with a train YOLO weight uh, for more than 80 different objects and class names. So you can uh, interchange it here and just see how it works and, and, and play with it and try to find other objects. Uh, YOLO is quite fast, even works in a uh, live video. Also, uh, the OCR instruction does not work in live video, so you cannot uh, extract text uh, live, but you can recognize objects uh, live. Thank you very much for your time. I think that this is uh, the end of the presentation, and then, of course, we're open to uh, questions, uh, if there is any. Hey there. Hey, Rodrigo. Well done, hats off, with live calling like that. Whew. You don't see that often, right? Um, there are a few questions, um, and the, but they were actually also for the previous presentation already, and uh, I just missed them. Um, so one from uh, Alexander, and he asked, in which use cases do you use a uh, natural language processing model alongside the image recognition model? Uh, well, uh, sometimes you need to classify um, what uh, the content of a document it is, uh, but then first you need to extract uh, the text uh, from different regions of interest. And uh, then you want to like a natural language processor to, to understand what it is. So it is usually used for classification. Uh, there are sometimes uh, like documents that are not pure text. So you first want to recognize where those hot areas are, extract the text and then send it uh, to uh, classification uh, process cool. or natural language process. Yeah. Nice, sounds good. And then uh, another question from Carlos. Uh, do you also have a way to filter out small patches of pixels once the image is in binary? So to remove connected pixels that are less than X amount of pixels in an area. Uh, I think that um, it really depends, right? So the, the thing is usually what you do is uh, if you have small patches of pixels, I'm not sure if you mean uh, noise by that, but uh, let's say that for example, you, uh, you have some grains or some dots left in your, uh, your picture after you, uh, after you optimize it or binarized it. Um, something that you can do is uh, one of the techni uh, techniques that we've discussed uh, is um, uh, erosion in this case you would use or dilation, it depends on which uh, uh, binary pattern you are uh, having. But um, what you can essentially do with erosion or uh, dilation is if you have like really small uh, dots uh, of noise still left in the image after binarizing, uh, it is possible to uh, to either erode or uh, dilate the image, and what will happen then is is that uh, these little dots will sort of be uh, yeah swallowed by the pixels surrounding it. Yeah. So yeah. one of the use cases sometimes you want to to split two objects that are very close to each other, and uh, when you do the thresholding, they have like some small bridge between, so it's not possible to detect them individually. It's like just a big bulk. So if you apply erosion, then you just cut a little bit uh, the, ed uh, the borders of it, so make them uh, split. Uh, so erosion uh, is uh, one of the ways uh, to make uh, remove these uh, small areas, patches yeah. that connect to two different objects. Yeah, he's basically asking that because he, uh, he answered now, yes, noise basically to erode without affecting the letters or numbers. Yeah, the thing yeah. is, is that you probably, you, you will hit the, the numbers if you only do erosion. Huh? But what you can do, for example, is uh, just imagine that you have, for example, some, some black dots and then uh, your background is white. So if you want to filter out those, uh, those black dots, you would dilate the white dots so that they sort of swallow these black dots, right? But then, of course, also you chip away a little bit from the letters uh, or the numbers, like you mentioned. So what you can actually do is, after you've applied um, uh, after you've applied dilation, if you then apply the opposite again, because the 
the dots are already gone, so they, they won't come back, but you can make, again, the letters a little bit bigger again. So you can sort of, uh, yeah, uh, bring back what you took away after you remove the dots. So this is uh, the process, I think it's called opening and closing. Uh, it's yeah. also something that's part of OpenCV. So it just means uh, erosion followed by dilation or the opposite. So dilation followed by erosion. Cool, cool, sounds great. And there's another question, and it's uh, asking for a friend. Uh, if you're a complete newbie in uh, computer vision, where should they start? That's a hard question to answer, but I think that uh, the, the the steps that we explained for us, uh, we learned them, but not in this order. I will say maybe go with uh, already trained machine learning model just to, to see results fast. So you don't really need to understand fully how it works to see results. And then start thinking about these uh, basic uh, morphological operations we explained and uh, what you want to achieve. Do you want just to detect things? You want to detect them, crop them, and then, uh, I don't know, get some information out of it and then work from it. So. Uh, but I think that uh, starting with machine learning models gives you re really like a feeling of uh, uh, yeah, uh, like achievement. You are doing something. It's not that hard to start. And then you say, well, uh, what I can do next? And uh, I will say that for morphological operations, uh, text recognition is one of the best starting points. Great, great. It was uh, very nice uh, to have you both here. These were the questions. Uh, it's also good to see that the cat is back. So uh, the cat is <laughs> again. She's uh, asleep now. Uh, uh, she's asleep now. Perfect. Perfect. Mm -hmm. So then, um, uh, yeah, did, you guys did a really great job. Uh, happy to have you here at Build. Um, then we have one insider information uh, still left to tell. And that is uh, the 23rd of uh, February. We will have the next uh, tech talk session where we will talk about how to build, host, uh, monitor, and uh, uh, debug containerized apps in Azure. So uh, if you want to be there, there are two ways to do that. So you can go to the meetup link that will eventually be posted inside uh, the comments of, uh, of the YouTube link and also on Twitch, I see. And um, uh, you can also hit a nice subscribe button, which is somewhere there, I think. Um, so uh, enjoy. I hope you all enjoyed it. Uh, please give a round of applause for our speakers. And uh, you can do that in the chat. They will be happy to receive them. And, I, and uh, that's it for today. Thank you all for joining. Thank, Thank you, you very much.